welcome to our Soil Health webinar today with very special guests, Brenda Barrett and Dr. Chris Nichols. Uh, very quickly here, I will be passing things over to Brenda. But for those of you that don't know Brenda, uh, she is our Rural Roots to Climate Solutions community animator and just recently launched our uh, Regenerative Farmers Lab. Brenda also manages Earthworks Farm near Stetler, Alberta with her husband, Vance. And we actually have her to thank for all the great things we've been able to do over the years. Uh, the Rural Roots to Climate Solutions project grew from an idea that she initiated uh, during her time at the Stetler Learning Center. So thank you very much, Brenda, and I will now be handing things over to you. Thank you, Marie. It's lovely to come, uh, come back as a guest. I think the very special should be reserved for Chris um, in terms of the expertise and the knowledge, but to, to come back to the platform uh, that we started just over three years and get to come and have this dialogue. Um, as Marie mentioned, uh, we farm um, in central Alberta and uh, it's been about an 11-year adventure, the two of us together, um, being back in Alberta and, and on this land. And it's really bringing me back to the beginning, um, getting to have this conversation with Chris. Is, as I look through her bio, um, the Rodell Institute being a key institution that she was a part of, as well as many of the others, um, we, when we came back to Alberta, connected with this idea of regenerative agriculture and had traveled actually down into the States a few times to, to get a better sense of the community, of the, the knowledge and the science behind it um, to get us started. So it's great to have it coming to Alberta now. Um, and even with the great news that uh, as much as in Alberta lately, it feels like we talk about talent leaving us. Uh, Chris has actually and her family have relocated to Alberta uh, the beginning of this year. So we can say, you know, agriculture is now also part of the talent acquisition for the province. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Chris Nichols shortly here. If you don't know, um, she is a leader in the movement to regenerate soils for healthy crops, food, people, and the planet, involved with organizations and institutes around the world, um, all the way from North America to Australia. Um, here in Canada, is involved as Director of Research and Extension with the Canadian Organic Growers in Ottawa. And here in Alberta is working with uh, our own Food Water Wellness Foundation in Olds, doing soil microbiology research and acting as an advisor there for their projects here in Alberta. Um, also involved with the, Sa the Savory Institute's Ecological Outcome Verification, which is an exciting new initiative coming out. And over 25 years, I believe, of a career, multiple publications, multiple awards, um, probably many that are much more prestigious than the one I'm going to mention, but also many of us have been probably in the last year watched the popular documentary Kiss the Ground, and Chris was, was also featured in that docu document, uh, Terry. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Chris Nichols, who I believe, and I got so excited to talk to her and get to know more about her, I forgot to get the exact um, points that she's going to cover. But I know we invited her to share with us some of the key points that she wish, wished all farmers knew, um, if I've got the briefing right. Um, and so Chris, I'll invite you to share your, your screen and uh, take it on over for me. Thank you so much for, for that great introduction, Brenda, and, and I'm very appreciative for that. And I'm, I'm extremely excited to be in Alberta. As Brenda mentioned, I'm, I'm new to Alberta, but very excited to, to be here. And what I am going to, I have a, a really brief bit of slides that I wanted to talk about, but then um, I'm hoping that we can have a, a fairly lively uh, Q&A or, or discussion session um, into this, because I think that that's, that's where we get a lot of our learning. I, uh, Brenda asked me about questions, and I said, yeah, I, I love questions. Um, frequently, I'll say that I love uh, questions, comments, uh, criticisms, and concerns. And I, I do like criticisms and, and concerns, because I like uh, learning. And so this offers an opportunity for me to learn. Um, I'm a soil microbiologist by training and kind of an example of, of sort of that learning and how we're really learning uh, and growing into this is uh, frequently I will tell this story about when I started um, my career as an undergraduate 
Uh, we talked about the fact that we knew about 10% of the organisms that were in the soil. We could culture them, identify them. We knew what they did. Um, and by the time that I finished my graduate work, um, we said that we knew about 0.1%. So the, the story with this, and, and this is why the criticisms and concerns are really important, is that I went to 12 years of higher education to become 100 times stupider than the day I walked in the door. Um, and this is this is what it is when we're talking about soil, is that it is a, a very um, dynamic type of a system. And so when we're going about approaching this, when I think about regenerative uh, agriculture and regenerative approaches, um, it is about utilizing biologically based solutions to address uh, the issues or the challenges that you might have. And I like to think of the, the issues or challenges more as options and opportunities. It, the, the challenges are an opportunity for you to look for a plethora of options that you can be able to put into place. But we're doing this from a uh, very um, system type of an approach. And the system is really from regenerative agriculture is really founded on this idea of regenerating soil. And and so that's what I'm going to highlight here is, is why we're why I'm saying that we we have to look at this from the perspective of, of regenerating soil. Uh, part of this is oftentimes what we'll do is we think about various types of practices or tools or activities that we can do to uh, enhance production to, to make those types of, of differences. But those are, I, I think of them more as, as band-aids on, on the overall problem, because we're not really looking at addressing, if we think about the soil first, then everything else ends up having to fall into place. It's every, every practice that we talk about, every tool that we're thinking about utilizing, what is that impact going to have on the soil? And if you think about that first, as opposed to what is the impact going to be on um, my productivity or, or other aspects like that, uh, I think it, it allows you to have the focus that's going to be able to build up the resilience that we're looking for. So um, in regenerating soil, kind of the way, again, I define regenerative agriculture, regenerating soil is this innovative, integrated, dynamic type of a system. It is dynamic and responsive to what is happening. So you go through a lot of different iterations and changes uh, and, and adaptations as we look at how we're going to be working with this mix of um, biodiversity changes and changes in, in the soil and changes in microclimates and those types of things that we're, we're all starting to see within building up the system. And what we're doing here is we're really, you know, building up organic matter, building up the biodiversity and increasing uh, the content of all of these different types of organisms, both above ground and below ground. Um, and again, taking this, this whole systems type of an approach that is really going to be relying on the power of photosynthesis, this idea of uh, looking at carbon flows and because carbon is the, the central building block for pretty much all life on the planet, both the, the structures of bodies as well as the uh, biochemical reactions that organisms undergo. And it also is the way in which not just as a structural building block, but also in a way that we process energy to do reactions and to do work. And so we're basically, the, the crop, I think of in, in agriculture and regenerating soils, your crop is harvesting sunlight. Your, your, your sunlight harvesters is, is what you're trying to do and trying to optimize within that. And then you're just using the, the plants and or the animals as a tool to participate in that carbon flow of the harvest of sunlight. So how is it that we're gonna keep um, increasing the amount of sunlight that we can harvest so that we can get more of this carbon uh, from an energy standpoint as well as from a from a building block standpoint. And it's all of this complexity that exists there. But the other thing that I think you know we need to sometimes we let the the whole idea of these complex systems, you know, I talked about, you know, we the number of organisms that we have in the soil and all of those complex interactions that are incurring. And sometimes we let that idea of the complexity impede our ability to 
try and understand or try and think about it. And so I think of it as is an interwoven, complex, yet elegantly simple, repeated pattern um, design matrix design. And the idea behind that is all living organisms follow some very simple rules. The first thing that we need for life is to be able to have food and food and water are, their, are our primary needs. So when we think about what our primary needs are, if we're trying to regenerate the soil, we're trying to actually grow soil and soil is carbon, hydrogen and oxygen bound to sand, silt and clay. It's not it's not the sand, silt and clay, it's not the, the earth or the land itself, but soil is different because soil has that organic component to it, that organic matter that comes from carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And so for us to be able to regenerate soil, it isn't about getting more land, um, but it's actually about getting that carbon into that mineral environment in order to be able to do that level of regeneration and growing of that environment. And one of the things when I think about sort of regenerating the soil and helping to kind of make these connections is thinking about how soil originated in the first place. Because again, we had, um, when when Earth was sort of formed from space dust, we, we had a, a planet that had uh, over time, it didn't start this way, but over time, as it got to how we see Earth today, you had an aquatic environment and you had a mineral land environment, but you didn't have soil. We didn't have soil until we started to have plants growing on land and then the animals could evolve from that. And we couldn't have plants growing on land until we had this, this interaction between a photosynthetic bacteria and a fungus. So in this aquatic environment, if you kind of want to maybe close your eyes and go back in your mind and, and think about yourself in this aquatic environment that life started in. And in this environment, you had a uh, bacteria that could do photosynthesis. And so it could manage quite a few of its own food needs because it was making food via photosynthesis, that carbon that was happening. But to make the enzymes to do photosynthesis and to make some of the enzymes that are involved in some of the other biochemical reactions, it needs not just carbon, but it also needed other nutrients, especially micronutrients. Molybdenum is a micronutrient that's important in the photosynthetic reaction. And in this aquatic environment, yes, those micronutrients were around, but this is a very large diffuse environment and you're a single celled organism. And the only time in which you could potentially be able to make more enzymes to do better photosynthesis is if you encountered molybdenum. And your odds of encountering molybdenum, you know, on a frequent basis were extremely low, especially when you're a single celled micron sized microorganism. Um, and so in the same environment, uh, in the uh, you had fungi that started to evolve and they started to evolve because they started to, to feed off of the dead uh, bacteria cells. And so fungi started to evolve in this environment and one day, you know, kind of making a story out of this is one day the, the bacteria cell happened to bump into the fungal cell. And it just so happened that the fungal cell was was starving because it couldn't make its own carbon, it would have to eat dead bacteria in order to be able to live. And so it was it was hungry, but it had a lot of mineral nutrients, because Bacterium is a single cell micron size, but the fungus is the long threads. And so the long threads have what we call a greater surface area to volume ratio. It had more exposure to that aquatic environment so it could pick up those nutrients. So it was more efficient at picking up those nutrients, the molybdenum and other micronutrients that are needed for photosynthesis. And um, the that they they sort of joined together and they created a relationship in which they started working together where the fungus would get the micronutrients and the bacterium would do photosynthesis and it would feed some of that photosynthate some of those carbon sugars to the back to the fungus so that it could be able to do this and because they were uh, more efficient and when they worked together they could actually grow into larger and larger numbers. So you started to see these large colonies of these organisms growing together. And 
inevitably they would start washing up on onto the land and as they started washing up onto the land they would wash up into the same space into the same place on on land you know you'd have the currents the 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 tides that would bring them into very similar spaces and um they started to sort of pile on top of each other and if you're a photosynthetic bacteria and you're at the bottom of the pile you can't do photosynthesis anymore and so that started they started to evolve different types of structures and one of the structures they started to evolve is roots because the roots were essentially initially designed as anchoring structures so that similar to you know lodging that we'll see in plants today the whole idea was as you grew up trying to get closer to sunlight you wanted to make sure that you didn't fall over so the anchoring structure was there, but the absorptive structure and the way of being able to get the minerals from the soil was still, or from that, that land environment, was still critical to have the fungal relationship. And so then as the bacteria and the fungus died and you started to build up because you started to build up organic matter, and now you started to get soil. And so if we're going to talk about regenerating soil, we need to, the key is to really optimize these relationships that are going to be far more efficient at being able to obtain nutrients from the soil, deliver them effectively to the plant, and allow the plants to be able to grow and do more photosynthesis to get more of that photosynthate and more of that carbon below ground to really regenerating the soil. And so that's why I spend some time on sort of how this all originated, because if we can't think about how, how something started, how can we regenerate something when we don't know how it, it came to, into being in the first place? So really this, this idea of um, the whole idea of you had no soil without plants and you had no plants without fungi. We need to be having these integrated relationships that are really working within uh, optimizing photosynthetic activity and uh, those types of reactions. And what we can see when we do this, this is a, a picture from a, a farmer in the US, uh, David Brandt uh, near Carroll, Ohio. And um, what David has done is over about 30 years, he has transformed the soil that you see uh, in the top right to what you see in the soil in the in the bottom left. And that has happened. Um, so these soil samples, essentially the one that was in the top right that was taken across the fence row from David's farm. Um, and that's what his soil is classified as. That's what his soil should look like. But if you look at um, the soil, how he's been able to regenerate and add the organic matter, you can still see uh, the original parent material that's a part of that soil in that soil in the in the bottom left. But the whole idea with that is that you've got that dark richness that comes from the organic matter and doing those regenerative processes to to start to regenerate the soil, working within working with trying to enhance the activity of the fungi and the bacteria and the microorganisms and improving that biodiversity to really be able to get that regeneration. And so when I think about this, uh, you know, I talk about the the fact that I, I think that we have one problem in agriculture and it's a carbon problem. And the carbon problem is that we don't have enough soil. We don't have enough carbon below ground. Our soils are deficient. Um, so we need to be able to look at how we can go about regenerating that. And when we do this, it is, you know, thinking about how we're going to, and I'm actually going to skip to, I'm going to skip a couple. I'm going to go here because uh, in this, when we're, when we're trying to do this, is the whole idea behind this is to look at some of the, the principles and practices that we can put into place um, in order to be able to do this regeneration. And there's a lot of people who talk about soil health and soil health principles. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join with them, but I'm going to try and do it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and so what I've done is I've taken these soil health principles and I've put them into this pyramid. And um, I have six soil health principles here. Most people have four or five. Um, and I've got, I've got six of them that we're gonna talk about. But the whole idea of putting them first off into this pyramid design is I don't want you really to be thinking about the different levels of the principles as sort of a hierarchy. 
because when we think about pyramids, pyramids have stood for thousands of years because every every layer and every stone, every block that was placed played a particular role to help to support the blocks above and support the blocks below and the blocks to each side. In order for that structure to be stable and stand for thousands of years, you needed to have that integrated block design. And so that's what we're trying to do. And the blocks are these different tools that you could use within the different principles, but they're all integrated together into this design for it to be able to stand. And the other reason why I, I like using sort of this pyramid type of an illustration is again, this pyramids have stood for thousands of years. And I want us to be thinking about our, our farms as something that air, something that's going to stand as as farms and in agriculture not just for uh centuries but for millennia because this is what we need to be focusing on is how can you keep the farm not just you know for the next generation or for the next century but really for millennia in order to be able to do that so thinking about kind of the different roles that the blocks can have and put into place um and when I think about this, you know, we're, we're talking about, again, looking at this from the perspective of regenerating soil and looking at how this is going to impact carbon flows. And so we're going to have photosynthetic activity. We're going to try and increase photosynthetic activity. And, you know, here up in Canada, one of the things that I encourage all of the producers to be thinking about is that you have a minimum of 260 days in which you should be growing something. That doesn't mean growing something to its full life cycle, but growing something for a minimum of 260 days. That's 105 days that you're taking off in vacation. That's 105 days of starvation for the soil. That's a very long period of time, but I'll admit it's it does get a little cold in Canada. So, you know, I'll admit that, that this can be a little bit of an issue, but we can't keep telling ourselves that, you know, we can only grow something for 90 or 120 days. We have to start looking at it, our crop is harvesting sunlight. The sun shines 365 days a year throughout most of Canada. So you really have to maximize how much of those how many of those days you can be harvesting that sunlight. And every day you take off is again, it's a starvation day for the soil because you're not putting carbon below ground. And so we really wanna be able to look at how we can minimize that. And when we think about the different plants that we can be growing, that's gonna help us integrate more biodiversity above ground, which is in, in our plant communities, which is gonna integrate more biodiversity in the animal communities above ground, uh, including um, insects and bats and birds. Those are important components to have, not just uh, grazing animals or wild animals, but it also is improving that biodiversity that we have below ground and stimulating the different types of organisms that are gonna be growing. We're also gonna be looking at reducing disturbance. So I'm gonna talk about kind of the four primary ones that people talk about a lot. Reducing tillage or reducing disturbance. That doesn't mean that you have to go into a complete no-till system all the time, but what you wanna look at is how we're going to be managing that disturbance to have the least amount of impact on the system. And we wanna make sure that we are protecting the soil surface as well. Um, making sure that we've got mulches or residues on the soil surface, and more importantly, making sure that we've got living plants growing on the soil surface. Because although you could, you know, manage residue or other things like that as that armor protection, you actually get more benefit from protection that comes from a living plant. It's better able to absorb the energy from solar radiation from wind and from rainfall that cause, that are destructive forces impacting the surface of bare soil. So if you've got a living plant that has a better capability absorbing the, more of the energy so it has less of an impact on that soil surface. And then we want to be able to integrate livestock. And when we're talking about livestock or animals in this process, we're talking not just about having to have grazing animals on the landscape, 
but also ways in which, again, you can manage birds and bats and bees and, and other insects. And so being able to look at managing the impact, what those, what those organisms do, what those animals do is they have an impact on the plant that will actually stimulate the plant to put more carbon and resources below ground. So all of this is about carbon flow. How do we make sure one, we keep the carbon that gets into the soil, in the soil, so that reducing disturbance and the protection can help with that. Doing the diversity and the photosynthetic activity is helping to get more carbon into the soil. Managing livestock can stimulate the plants to put more carbon below ground. And then the other thing we wanna do is we wanna reduce or eliminate inputs into the system, especially synthetic inputs into the system. And what this does is this actually, again, stimulates the plants to work with the biology. Going back to that, you know, bacteria that was in that aquatic system, if someone came along and injected the micronutrients right around where that bacterium was growing, was living in that aquatic environment, there'd be no reason for that bacteria to give any carbon to the fungus to try and get those micronutrients because those micronutrients were already available to that uh, bacterium. The same thing is true in our current agro ecosystems. When we add too much fertility to those systems, what ends up happening is that outsources the jobs of the microbial community because many of the microbes are involved in this whole idea of nutrient flow and nutrient cycling to the plant. And if we don't have, if the plant doesn't need them because the plant has all of its nutrient resources, it's not going to give any uh, carbon to the um, back to the fungus in order to be able to do this or to the other microorganisms. So another way of thinking about this is, you know, six soil health principles kind of sometimes can be a little bit intimidating or a little bit complex. So, and what was that sixth one or, you know, <laughs> what was the third one again? And rather than thinking about that, one of the things that we can do is to think about treating the soil the way that we're supposed to treat ourselves. Again, this goes back to that repeated design matrix where all life follows the same type of rules. We want to make sure we get fed. How do I feed the soil? The soil's food is carbon. What are the practices that I put into place that are actually going to be putting carbon in the ground or extracting carbon from the ground? How do I make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a balance of both because I need to be harvesting a crop, but when, how can I make sure that I'm putting more in than I'm taking out? when it comes to those carbon flows. So again, treating the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves, we're supposed to eat small meals throughout the day. We're supposed to be grazers. This goes back to that whole idea of, of feeding, but also making sure that we don't have feast and famine periods. Our current agro ecosystem is all based around feast and famine periods for the soil. If you wanna build up carbon and you wanna build up microbial activity and biodiversity and, and enhance that life, if you're starving them for more than half of the year, they're not gonna build up to a very high rate in that system. So you wanna make sure that you've got that where you're, you're eating the small meals throughout the day or for us, making sure we've got as much photosynthetic activity happening as many days of the year as possible. Making sure that we eat a diverse diet. Again, that is part of that diversity. The biodiversity above ground is eclipsed by the biodiversity below ground. How can we get more of that diversity in the system? The whole idea of exercise and the whole idea of exercise, you know, it's like, huh? How am I going to get the soil to exercise? For the soil to exercise or the system to exercise, there needs to be a certain amount of stressors that we put on the organisms within the system. That's when we, you know, exercise is all about how we put a little bit of stress on our body. We don't want to put so much stress on our body that it causes injury. So you don't wanna to exercise to injury, but what are the things that we could do that could be various types of stressors? Again, kind of going back and looking at this, disturbance is a stressor. It's a stressor. So how do we manage the disturbance in a way that causes a little bit of stress, but doesn't cause so much stress to injury? And naturally the ecosystems evolved where you had animals um, on the above ground landscape 
that did have some disturbance on the soil surface itself. So that was a little bit of a stressor on the soil surface. It also was a stressor on the plant. As I said, when you have animals, just animals walking through, uh, just uh, insects um, biting or sticking their proboscis through uh, part of the plant, all of that is an injury to part of the plant, which is a stressor. And that response to those stressors on the part of the plant is if I have a stressor, you know, when I'm doing exercise, what I do is, is I tear muscle fibers, which requires then my body to have to produce biomolecules that repair those muscle fibers and getting those resources back in. If, if I were to have an injury that were to, you know, a cut to the surface of my skin, some sort of injury like that, my body has to produce clotting factors to make sure that I don't bleed out through that cut. It has to produce antibodies to make sure that it doesn't get infected. The plants do similar types of things. They produce these stress biomolecules. And the great thing about the stress biomolecules from an animal consumer standpoint from you know a person who eats who eats plants or who eats animals that eat plants that is you know i get my antioxidants and polyphenolics from the food that i eat those molecules are actually stress biomolecules so the more that we reduce stress on the plant by adding too much fertility or adding too many pesticides or you know removing any type of stress on the plant in our brains we always thought well we had to get rid of all of the stressors because if it's a stressor it's going to reduce my productivity and i'm going to have lower yields but i need some amount of stress in order to be able to produce the quality of the food that i'm producing to have the antioxidants and polyphenolics and all of these different types of elements that we as animals and eaters of that plant material need for the plant it's protection um, against those stressors so one of the things that we can think about for those stressors is this fist acronym and this goes to thinking about how you're managing tillage how you're managing pest and disease issues and how you're managing fertility. It doesn't mean that you can't use any of those things, but what you wanna think about is how often am I putting those band-aids on? How often am I using those, those, those stressors? If I do it too frequently, that's gonna to cause too much, it's too much and it's gonna to cause too much injury that the plants are not gonna be able, that the, the system is not gonna be able to recover from. I want to think about the intensity and the scale of those stressors. How much of the soil volume am I disturbing? How much of the plant, if I, if I overgraze, that, that level of, of intensity and the scale at which I have cut off the plant is too much. So looking at how we're going to be able to manage that and then also looking at the timing of those stressors in order to be able to get that timing set up when it's going to be optimum for having the least amount of impact on the whole entire community. So how can you go about addressing those things? And that's what, you know, again, thinking about it, it, it isn't that you want to have too many stressors, but you want to have some. And when you have some of those stressors, when we're talking about those antioxidants and polyphenolics, those stress biomolecules, just like the enzymes for photosynthesis, what the plant does is the plant gives more carbon below ground to get the micronutrients that are part of the composition of those molecules. So you need to have in order to try and manage and increase carbon flow, because we're trying to get, we're trying to regenerate soil. We're trying to get carbon below ground. So we're going to keep photosynthesis going. We're going to add diversity. But now what we want to do is every plant that's growing, how do we make sure that that plant is shutting, shunting that material below ground? And so, you know, that exercise can be an important component of it and helping to protect, again, you know, treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves, protect your body from injury, radiation, temperature extremes. All of that is talking about that whole idea of the, the armor and protection, but that also that component that can happen with having the plants growing in the system, having all of these things um, thriving in such a way that they absorb the energy that normally would be destructive 
to the soil environment. But now what we're going to do is we're going to ha have it be enhanceive to the soil environment with the way that we manage those stressors. So that was kind of where I wanted to, to get us get us focusing as, as we go in and talk a little bit more about what's happening. We've got about 20 minutes or so uh, to be able to have a little bit of a chat. Great, thanks, Chris. Before you stop sharing your screen, could you go, oh. you beat me. I was yeah. say, could you go back to the pyramid? Because I, I had a question about that and it might be easier for you to speak with it in front there. So I'm gonna jump in with a couple questions um, and but also I would invite then at this time people to, if you if you have questions to either put them in the chat or find one of your reaction buttons, even that you can maybe raise your hand or something so that we can even start to take a bit of a list and Marie will manage that in for me. But when I saw this, what I heard you saying was talking about how you didn't want this to be a hierarchical system, but really talk about that integration piece and each, each piece being integral to the system and that interlocking that allowed the pyramids to last for millennial. Um, but what it made me think of is because of the way I think probably we've been taught and conditioned, I do look at this system and think maximize photosynthesis first then because it's the first base and then think diversity. And so I'm curious about that. Does it, does it matter where you start for you? Um. It, it doesn't matter where you start. I mean, I, I do agree with you that to a certain degree, you know, you, you can't really manage livestock or inputs or, or diversity or anything like that if you don't have plants. <laughs> so, you know, that that is a, a, there, although I don't want us to think about it from a higher hierarchical standpoint, there was in, in where I positioned the different layers, there was intention <laughs> that was there um, to a certain degree, because I know that that's a little bit of what we're going to be thinking about. And again, a lot of this is the more of the intention with this is the whole idea of carbon flow. So because I'm I'm looking at this from a carbon flow perspective and that foundation is the, the start of carbon flow. And then, you know, the diversity helps to enhance the carbon flow that you have. Um, reducing the inputs is a big part of the carbon flow going to the microbial community. Uh, the managing livestock can be another component of that and reducing disturbance can be another component of managing that flow. And then sort of the, the protection at the top is more about, you know, kind of keeping what you have in the soil in the soil. So it's, it, it, it is a little bit of a hierarchy in, in how we're going to be shifting and managing this carbon flow aspect. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna jump in with one more question and then uh, see what might be there within the participants. So when you talked about, um, and if you'd like, you can either keep screen sharing or if you wanna come off the front now you can, so you can see the rest of the faces to yourself. Um, so when you talked about the, the treating the soil as we treat ourselves, it did bring me back to conversations even 10 years ago when we were at the Acres USA conf conference. Um, and it even, and I'm kind of sometimes a funny person of how I make these connections, because if we talk about ourselves, this whole movement around fecal implants, where we've learned that the human biology, some people are actually missing the right biology to even begin a health journey. So they're having healthy biology introduced into their system. And I've heard these different conversations and opinions around the microbiology in our so soils. And if it is soil and pasture and land that have been, um, I'll use the word abused or mined or, or really you know, have a lot extracted from them over the years, can we trust that the biology is there? Is it a, in your opinion, perhaps in your experience, is it a, if you feed them, they are there? and they will flourish? Or do we also have to sometimes look at how do we introduce the biology and get it moving and going then? So that's a, it, it is a very interesting question. And I, I do see a lot of those similarities between um, the soil microbiome and the gut microbiome and, and how microbiomes function. Um, and although uh, the gut microbiome for animals is, uh, is incredibly complex and there's a lot of species there. There actually is 
there, there are limits on the diversity because it is an anaerobic environment. It is primarily an acidic environment. Um, it's a, the, the temperature regimes that you're looking at and different animals because of those conditions will have different types of gut microbiomes. So when we're trying to u utilize uh, fecal transfers and, and those types of things in order to try and stimulate the, the, the gut microbiome in, in the human, when we're talking about the diversity, because the diversity is overall much smaller than the, the diversity we'd be looking for in the soil to maintain function, that you could introduce that and really help with, with keeping the function going. Um, in, in a human being or in an animal, um, that an animal may have lost some of that, that capability. And the other thing is, is that part of where we get the microbiome that's in our gut does come one from our, our, our parents, in particular our mother, but also from the food that, that she eats as well as the food that we're eating. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's good. To, it's good to have a little bit of dirt on our stuff. Sometimes, you know, it gives us some of that that flora that we're looking for and needing to have. And so, um, part of why we've lost it is again the way that we've started eating as consumers and and how that affects that. When it comes to the soil, I am more of an advocate, and I see better results when it is that you're sort of if you feed it, they will come or they will they will grow type of a thing because because of the huge amount of diversity that exists within the soil it's hard for us to be able to get it right to know what types of flora that in and fauna that we want to incorporate into uh, the the soil and the other thing is is even if we are are able through various types of technology to understand which species are there or the dominant species that are there and let's you know well, let's introduce them um, we know the dominant species that are in this this eco region or or you know in crop fields or whatever let's introduce those and one of the issues exists there is that. Um, the, the species that are growing in a particular environment uh, adapt to that environment. And so when we're introducing the same species to that to an environment, but they were produced from a different environment or came from a different environment, there is a there is an impact that happens. And the same thing can happen for us. I mean, when you do these these fecal transplants are are will for a while while our body adapts, <laughs> will not feel as good <laughs> because those microorganisms have to adapt to this new environment that they're in, even though they're used to a similar type of environment. Um, that and and again, we couldn't do it where we took a, a fecal transplant from a cow and <laughs> thought that that would be good for us. Um, so even though the same species may exist there, it's just not necessarily the best thing. So I'm, I I I like us to put more investment in getting the system and managing the carbon flows to enhance the biology that's in the environment that you're in, because that's going to be the things that are working best in there. The exception, because everything always, you know, it's I, I'm, I'm a big yes and no type of, a, of an answer to question. The exception to this are there are some environments that are incredibly depleted, um, and we do do some things. Uh, we we still uh, utilize various types of pesticides that can pretty much kill everything. We do fumigate, uh, especially in produce production, in large scale produce production. There is fumigation that is pretty much killing everything. Um, and we will we will do that. And in those cases, I would say adding back in a microbial community can be helpful. And in produce production, in many cases, it also could be helpful to add back in, even if you're not doing the fumigation. Um, that would be a where a place where I could see us utilizing some of these um, microbial products because part of the the thing with produce production is a very fast growth cycle and very fast turnaround of things. And it's very depleting to the soil because of that. So being able to have the, the microorganisms that are gonna be adapted to that. The other thing that I would say, and I know I'm giving a very long answer to this, but the other thing that I would say when we're looking at microbial um, amendments that we would add is oftentimes from a research perspective, we basically would look at what we refer to as a native or an undisturbed location 
and that would be nearby and we would take the microbiome that would be there and we would try and introduce it into uh, uh, the cropland location. And it doesn't work out very well to do that. One is, again, it's a completely different type of an environment and a completely different type of a growing pattern that you've now established yeah. in the cropland. We need to think of, although we want to use natural ideas and natural cycles and mimic some of the natural cues in our agroecosystems, growing crops is an unnatural act. When, when, you know, if you look naturally as civilizations evolved from sort of the hunter gatherers to then crop production, that is changing the way that the plants perform. The plants do not mm -hmm. want to produce that many seeds. They don't want to produce that much foliage. They don't want to produce the same level of, of material that it is that we're harvesting for our own food needs. And so because of the way that we're doing this, and this goes back to that produce um, environment too, when we're trying to grow uh, plants in a very fast turnaround cycle, not allowing for you know, long-term growth and adequate senescence and all of those types of things that you would normally be looking for in the way that the plant functions physiologically, um, oftentimes in order to be able to get the responses that we need to have is we do want to have more bacteria because they grow very quickly and they are able to work in complex consortia to be able to provide for functionality. What we're looking for is functionality out of the soil in our agroecosystems. And when we want to have that function, we want to make sure that the, the organisms that are going to provide that function that we're looking for are actually there. So, you know, again, if you, if you were going to use soil or landscape for uh, construction, you'd want to have different function coming out of that soil or that landscape. And so how you would look at managing that landscape would be different. So again, it's, it's one of those things where um, I think we need to pay attention to what you're growing and um, how you're growing it. And I would also just, you know, nine times out of 10, I would say, if, if you want to spend money on a microbial amendment, I would far rather see you spend money or be more comfortable with potential uh, yield declines by putting in uh, various types of regenerative blocks into your pyramid, um, rather than, than spending money on, on the microbial amendments. Right. Thank you so much. I think there's about five different points that I need to come back to in that when I listen to the recording <laughs> in order to really think them through. So thank you so much. I want to, um, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. So I thought it'd be great if we were able to open it up to some of the participants. If anybody has any questions, I guess, um, Marie, what's the best way to manage that? Whoever um, comes off mute first and starts talking. Yeah, yeah, please everyone don't be shy. And this is a great opportunity to ask Chris a question um, in person. So if you do have a question, just unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, Leslie, go ahead. So <clears throat> what I'm wondering, I, I'm not talking from a farm perspective, it's a garden perspective, though it would relate to say vegetable production. And I'm wondering about, I, I've been thinking about that whole sort of paradigm where we we rotate crops so we grow nothing but coal crops in one area and then nothing but another type of crop and so we, does that not leave certain um my, microbes sort of starving for a certain length of time and wouldn't it be better to integrate crops i'm just wondering uh, yeah if you could I, comment on that i would like to hear Yes, that's that's a very good point, Leslie. And and I would say yes. I, I would I, I always prefer integration of crops or or at the very least rotation that you know this isn't this isn't the area of your garden that you grow just this crop. Every year it's that same crop that's grown in that area of the garden, but you'd want to be able to to rotate crops throughout the garden. But again, the, the integration and there's so much that we're learning about how different plants feed each other. Um, and help each other, not just with some pest and disease management, but also feeding each other various types of nutrients. You get plant to plant nutrient transfer of, of many elements from one plant to another. And 
if they're spatially distant, it doesn't mean that that transfer can't happen, but it's more efficient and effective if those things are, are nearby. So I would, I would always favor integration. Um, it again goes back to the, the whole idea of balancing what's best for the soil with what you're wanting to achieve as far as functionality and getting from the soil. And, you know, if you're doing a, a very highly integrated, sometimes when in, in the gardens that I've had, you know, I'll go out there and just throw a mix of seeds out there. And it's, and it's with intention that I'm throwing a mix of seeds. It's not just because, you know, I don't have a lot of time, but it's with intention that I'm throwing a mix of seeds. But it does take more time. To, to have to, to work with, with maintaining and working with that mixture more than you would, um, you know, and that's why we've gone to the cropping systems that we do is you could do it on a larger scale with less labor in order to be able to, to grow monoculture based things. Um, so it, it is one of those things where, you know, you have to think about all of those aspects. And I also know that the trade-off that I have with throwing that mix of seeds out there is that I'm going to have a, a lower yield overall, but I'm not trying to optimize for for the yield. I'm trying to optimize for the soil, and that that trade-off is carbon above ground or per carbon below ground. What we've done is we've taken a system where the plants naturally would want to put 70 to 80 percent of their carbon below ground, and we've transformed it into a system where we're driving the plants to put 70 to 80 percent of their carbon resources above ground. I'd like to, to see us get closer to a 50-50 split. And if we can actually achieve that um, more often in some way, that, that's where I think we can go. So just one other question, and it relates to people who would be growing crops like on, a, on scale and might want to start to integrate more than one um, crop at the same time. In your work, have you found any place or really good systems of harvesting where you can, you know, sort of separate the crops. I mean, we you can do it by height, I know, but if you don't really have height as an as an option, as we might not in our area. So um, there's there's a couple of different things there. Uh, it it obviously does depend on the type of crop that you're that you're harvesting and making those differences. Um, with the with the type of harvesting equipment. So yes, you can adjust. If you're looking at grain crop production, you know, you could in, adjust based on height, the the um, harvesting equipment, uh, so that you may not uh, damage some of the, the plants that are shorter in stature than others. Um, there is in in many of the prairie provinces um, in Canada. Uh, so I, I apologize. Well, I'm assuming you're in Alberta, I guess. So yeah. it's not quite as common in Alberta, um, but it's done quite a bit in uh, Saskatchewan and um, a little bit in Manitoba. Um, they are working on this actually up uh, Napara up in the North Peace country has been doing these things where they're doing um, polycropping and they're growing two crops at the same time. They uh, do a lot of uh, canola and peas and they refer to it as piola. And so you're harvesting both of those crops at the same time, but then you can separate out the, the seeds um, right. because of the seed size. So it's, it's harvesting them, but then running, it, running those, the grains through a seed sorter to separate out the seeds. And they'll do that with a number of different types of crops if they have the different size of seeds. Now, um, there are also uh, some people who are some producers who've been working on and then companies have taken it on to um, do some different things with some harvest equipment where uh, I've got a producer uh, in the States in um, Indiana and he grows uh, wheat and soybeans at the same time. And the wheat obviously is going to get harvested uh, way before the soybeans get harvested. But what he has done is uh, he plants them. Um, essentially, the, the plants are on, the individual plant species are on 30 inch rows, but he uses a 15 inch row planter. So it's every other row. And then when he goes through to harvest his wheat, um, he does use a, a, a stripper header. So he does cut it high, but that still would impact the, the soybean plants. 
So um, what has been created is it looks a little bit like a, a sled or a ski that is on um, the head for the for harvesting the wheat that essentially is goes over the rows where the beans are. So it's mounted on the header and goes over the rows where the beans are and it just sort of pushes them down. And because it's got that that sled shape that the curve at the front, it doesn't slice into them. And soybeans are really fickle. If you damage, they're really fickle and it's a big issue like with frost tolerance because if their top leaves get damaged, the plant is done. It, it, it does not like its top leaves to get damaged at all. So this, this whole idea of this, sket, this sled is it's got that curve that really pushes the beans down and then you can go in and, and harvest the, um, uh, the wheat and then come back in and harvest the beans. And one of the really cool things that he's found is he actually gets uh, a much higher yield within the beans when he does this because the beans then can really bush out into that space. And it, it is like they'll, they'll get in and cover that whole entire space. He came at this, he was actually, uh, a, had a horticultural degree and um, used to do landscaping. And he came at this from the perspective of thinking about how you fill in plants with landscaping. Your landscaping design isn't always to make it, you know, have that full perspective initially, but it's what plants you place where so that they can fill in the space over time. And so that's what he's taken to his farmscape as far as the way that we're looking at it. And so sometimes too, it's these innovations and tools that we're talking about. And, you know, I'll talk with producers all the time. No-till agriculture was not created by John Deere. No-till agriculture was created by farmers that had an issue that they wanted to address and how they wanted to go about addressing it. It was created by adapting machinery. How do we look at in, in many of these cases with regenerative agricultural practices, putting in, I mean, the future of agriculture, I really believe is mixing perennials and annuals together and having perennial understory crops in your annual production and in your, in your perennial pastures, including annuals to help to improve uh, soil health as well as forage quality, utilizing these, these plants as tools, again, we're talking about regenerating the soil, all of these things become tools. And now I need to think about tools for how to manage my plants or my animals in order to be able to do this. Doing different things, again, looking at animal management, um, worked with uh, some people who were looking at uh, the impacts of bats on insect predation. And um, what they did was strategically would be placing bat houses around their fields so that the bats would have to fly over and target those areas where they had the greatest level of insect pressure. How do we go about adapting tools to achieve what it is that we're looking for? It's not just one solution, but it's everything on the table. As you were talking, Chris, it made me think about um, growing up in, in my generation would have grown up in the prairie, no, not the prairie farm report. The, oh my gosh, I can't remember the TV show, but I remember every almost Sunday afternoon, my dad, and it was just highlighting prairie farmers and their innovations they came with up on their farm and that whole diversification piece and how it was driven by farmers and farmers as scientists and innovators. Um, so maybe we need a regenerative egg prairie, prairie farm report <laughs> or whatever that. <laughs> Highlighting all these tools, innovations that are there to help us do both the work for the soil as well as our, our yields. Um, are you okay for yeah. time, Chris? I mean, we kind of were aiming yeah. for the hour, but I still have yeah. a couple questions that have come yeah. in. And I feel like Ryan Jesperson, who's now gone to his podcast and he doesn't have the constraints of radio. There's no hard stop <laughs> on the hour and we don't have to be world news. We can just keep rolling. Um, if you're okay with that, and hopefully participants can stay along. I had a question come in, and I hope I don't really, I've never had to say this word out loud, I realized. Um, can you explain the nitrogen fixing process of leguminous plants? So yes. legumes? The yeah. Nitrogen fixing um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting process. And I want to I want to point out too, that when we're talking about nitrogen fixation, uh, it's not just that you have to have legumes in the system. There are also a lot of free living nitrogen fixers. And uh, one of the, the 
interesting thing that's interesting things that's happening. Um, it's it's a little bit less relevant to uh, this area of Canada, but um, there are some people who are looking at what they refer to as nitrogen fixing corn, and it actually isn't the corn plant that is working with the nitrogen fixing bacteria directly in the same way that the legume does, but it actually is, and, and this came from um, the indigenous communities and from the original varieties of, of maize um, that will do this, that they will, off of, off of their crown roots, you'll see this um, group of exudates that come off of the, the crown roots that are essentially containing sugars and will create a biofilm that will protect the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria there. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, we have going on with nitrogen fixation, so this goes back to the nitrogen fixation process, is um, the nitrogen fixation process is where you have a bacteria that has the enzymes that are capable of breaking the triple bond in nitrogen gas. It takes a lot of energy to break that bond, which is why when we make nitrogen fertilizer, uh, it's a very energy intensive process. The, the Haber-Bosch process takes a lot of energy. And so when we're looking at removing nitrogen fertilizer as a, from a, from a uh, climate change perspective, if we could remove that, that would take a lot of the, the energy out of the equation um, because it's a huge energy intensive process. So the bacteria um, will do this. It has an enzyme called nitrogenase and that is able to break that triple bond and separate the, the nitrogen. And then it has to happen, this process has to happen in anaerobic conditions so that you can actually, you, you're getting the creation of nitrate nitrogen, but the way that you go about doing that, even though nitrate is nitrogen and oxygen, you have to do it in an anaerobic environment because you have to have the oxygen in a, in a reduced form for it to be able to bond with the nitrogen. So you're essentially, and I don't wanna to get too much into the chemistry and the weeds here, but the idea is, is when you're doing the nitrogen fixation, uh, the bacteria um, that's involved in this with a legume plant, they will form those nodules. And that basically is the root cell will enlarge and encompass the bacteria inside the, the root cell wall itself so that they'll be sort of encompassed and protected in there in a way that is reducing the amount of oxygen. It creates an anaerobic environment for this to be able to occur. And so then you have the bacteria that break this bond and add oxygen to the nitrogen in order to be able to create, and they will create um, nitrite. And then that actually goes and it gets processed by other bacteria to then start to create the, the um, nitrate uh, that, that is utilized. So it's a multi-stage process happening with, with a group of different organisms. But the idea behind this is there, there's a couple of different things. And one of the things that I find so intriguing is the fact that nitrate, like most of the, the fertilizers or most of the nutrients that the plants take up, phosphate and sulfate, though, when, when those elements are in that form, it's actually a toxic form to life. It's, it's not compatible with living organisms. So one of the great things about relying on the biological community to do this is in particular, nitrogen is a problem because unlike phosphate or sulfate, they can get bound up with minerals and not stay in that toxic form, but nitrate will stay in that toxic form, especially in soil water. And so what ends up happening is if the nitrate concentration is too high in the soil, there's actually feedback loops that will stop the enzymes, they deactivate those enzymes that are involved in the process of fixing nitrogen. So one of the things that we've started to find, and the reason I point this out, is one of the things that we started to find in our intensive agricultural systems, because we've added so much nitrogen fertilizer to those systems, that then when it comes to incorporating a legume, that that there's so much nitrogen fertilizer in that soil that that legume won't even work with the bacteria anymore. It won't, it won't do this process because the bacteria 
can't do it. There's the, the feedback loop shuts them off and they can't fix the nitrogen. And so the, the uh, plant itself won't create this environment for this to happen because there's no need for it. So we are starting to see various types of legumes that have been um, grown in these intensive systems that aren't really nodulating anymore. And the same thing goes to this free living nitrogen fixation that I talked about with corn. It will also work with other grasses where you have these free livers that fix nitrogen, but they need to have an environment that's anaerobic. And that's what that biofilm that's on the, the um, crown roots or the brace roots of the, the corn um, that will basically they create because that's exposed to the air but they create the biofilm that makes it an anaerobic environment for the bacteria to be able to work. Other grasses can do a similar type of thing, but again, it isn't an environment that's created by the roots changing structure. It's by these various types of biofilms that need to be created for this anaerobic activity. But we really want to be looking at how it is that we can keep this carbon flow and this linkage between the plants and the bio biological community instead of, and this is what I talked about with outsourcing the jobs of the biology, is if we add it, just like you know, I said, adding the molybdenum around that photosynthetic bacterium that started all of this, if we add it, there's no reason for the plant, it's, it's free to the plant. The plant doesn't care how it got it. All it needs is it needs to have these elements. So um, what we wanna do is really drive the interactions. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned weeds in your answer. And so the next question actually <laughs> speaks about weeds in that um, commenting that around crops, there's lots of information around mycorrhizal differences around the crops, but how do common weeds compare and which ones are more mycorrhizal? Um, so for the most part, what we've seen is that many of what you would call the classic weeds are not mycorrhizal. And this again goes back to, I know I keep stepping on this, but carbon allocation and carbon flows. Uh, most of the classic weeds are involved in, and when I talk about classic weeds, they are plants that are basically successional plants. When there's an open space on bare soil, the soil, as people say, the soil doesn't like to be naked. It, it likes to be covered. It likes to have something there. And so nature has basically evolved to create these weedy plants that what their job it to, is to do is just make a whole lot of seeds so that they can rapidly cover and colonize an environment, that they can have that mass. So you get, again, a lot of the classic weeds are ones that are producing a huge amount of seeds. And because you're producing a huge amount of seeds, that's carbon allocated above ground and not carbon allocated below ground. So most of the classic weeds are not associated with the mycorrhizal fungi because again, the plant doesn't have enough carbon resources to do that. It puts most of its carbon resources into seed production. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't, they all aren't, it's just most in general that, that that's happening. So in many cases, people have looked to mycorrhizal fungi as being able to help the, the crop plants or the non-weedy plants so that they're more vigorous and can help to outcompete the weedy plants in that environment. Um, when we're looking for Crop plants in general, uh, most of our crop plants are going to be associated with the mycorrhizal fungi. And again, most of the weedy plants are not going to be associated with the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but uh, crop plants that are uh, considered to be, for the most part, non-mycorrhizal are usually in the brassica family. So in your grains, you're looking at uh, canola uh, primarily, you're also uh, safflower, um, but in the... Um, produce, you're looking at things like broccoli and cauliflower. Um, and uh, again, in, in grain production, we have things like uh, turnips and radishes um, that are uh, non-mycorrhizal, and that would be the same in, in produce production. So one of the things, too, in talking about how we could look at managing our landscape a little bit differently is if you are growing in your garden, growing some of these produce plants that are non-mycorrhizal, having it where you have uh, close by in that area 
where you have those plants having a highly mycorrhizal plant that would be there. Uh, many of the legumes are going to be highly mycorrhizal, uh, peas and beans, um, and many of the grasses are also highly mycorrhizal. More of the warm season plants are usually more strongly mycorrhizal than the cool season plants. Um, but again, it's it's it, it's overall. I, I'm painting a very broad brush with all of this, so you know the nuances of all of these different types of things do exist out there. But again, it's it's looking at trying to utilize the biology to help our non-weedy species have a leg up and outcompete the weedy species. And making sure we don't have bare soil, don't keep the soil naked, don't let the weeds want to be there. Great. Um, I mean, and you've talked a couple times about, it is about the context in a specific case, and someone just had wanted to check in, is it possible to contact you after this session if they have questions about specific areas? And if it's a yes, what's the best place for people to contact you, Dr. Nichols? Um, yes, and I will type in and share my email. Um, and you can feel free Great. to contact me. Uh, so I'm going to put this caveat on there. Um, I am, and I know this about myself, so this is where the caveat comes from. I am a very horrible person as far as realizing how much time has passed in life. And so, uh, you know, it will, it will maybe have been a week since I talked to you or, you know, two weeks or whatever since you emailed me. And I'll be like, I got to get back to that person. I got to get back to that person. I'll think about it, but it won't happen immediately. Um, in very many cases, I'm trying to get better about it. But the caveat with this is feel free to pester me. I am okay with people pestering me because you have to hold me accountable. But um, you also have to know that I need to be held accountable. So don't worry about following up. Oh, that's a very generous <laughs> offer to allow people to pester you. Um, building on the mycorrhizal uh, piece, somebody asked, well, using spent mushroom soil replace or help replace the mycorrhizal ingredients? So in, in some cases, uh, it can. Um, when we're talking about mushrooms, that is a different type of mycorrhizal fungi than the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi or the endomycorrhizal fungi that uh, are important in with most of the, the crop plants in our agroecosystems. So the mushroom producing uh, fungi are uh, if they are mycorrhizal, they're primarily ectomycorrhizal. Um, you can also have obviously mushroom producing fungi that, and for the most part, when they're growing, the difference, some of the main difference between the endomycorrhizal and the ectomycorrhizal or the mushroom producing fungi is they have a saprophytic phase. They can grow saprophytically as well as um, biotrophically or with a, with a plant, with a living plant. So they can eat dead stuff as well as getting uh, sugars from a living plant. The endomycorrhizal fungi can't feed off of dead material. So they can only get sugars from the living plant. They need to have living plants that are associated with the mycorrhizal fungi um, in order for them to be able to be growing in the system. Now, that being said, that uh, spent mushroom soil um, can be a, a good new source of nutrients um, because you can have uh, quite a bit of, again, they're breaking down, um, they're living saprophytically, so they're breaking down organic matter and putting those organic constituents, they're primarily using most of the carbon that comes from that. But when you break down any organic matter, um, it's any waste product that comes from any organism is also going to contain nutrients um, on some level and kind of going back to this this gut microbiome uh, basically every every organism has carbon as its main food product but food need but when we're looking for elemental nutrients we all get them from poop we all get them from waste <laughs> what goes into our body we don't we don't again our gut microbiome processes the food that we eat we, we're, we eat food, we chew food, we break it into small little bits. So if you don't chew well, your, your gut microbiome gets upset because you chew it, it goes into your gut and the gut process, the microbes process that, break it down, take the carbon out of it, most of the carbon out of it and eat um, and give you what they, what they, their waste, what they poop out. So we all, we all live off of poop. 
Everybody <laughs> does. That's the way that biology works. And that poop is, is high in nutrients. And so the spent mush mushroom soil can be a very good fertility source. But again, you want to be careful about how much the, the concentration density that you're applying it. It's similar to vermicompost because it is very high in nutrients because it's a waste product. And those nutrients, again, are in a plant toxic form. If you add too much of it in too high of a concentration, especially around seeds and seedlings, that is going to kill those plants. So mixing it with soil is what you're going to want to do if you're going to be adding that material or applying it. If you apply it over, you know, your farmscape, um, you know, that's why when we apply compost or we apply mushroom compost or, or any type of biological material on a large farmscape, you usually put it out in a spreader like you would with a manure spreader and spread it out so that it isn't in that high density that's going to cause the toxic reaction. Nice. Great. Um, so for, for the sake of time, and I know we're all, you know, probably have other things that uh, we maybe don't want to get to and would <laughs> rather be here. I am going to wrap us up a little bit. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question here, Chris, and then I'll maybe pass back to Marie once you're done answering uh, just to wrap us up. Marie, one of the questions I think I had was, I know we're recording. So where might this be available for people if they want to, I want to listen to it again. Um, so my last question for you, Chris, is I guess maybe more philosophical or social than biological. Um, but I'm curious, as you've, um, you know, you moved to Alberta, but it's been, I think, at least a couple years that you've been working more intensively, even with some farmers here and with Kim Cornish at Food Water Wellness. Has anything surprised you? Um, well, yes. Uh, well, I guess not surprised, but but delighted me and, and made me happy about wanting to, to move to Canada. Um, just coming from the U.S., there's a lot of sociopolitical things that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time getting into. But um, coming from the U U.S. up to Canada, uh, I guess from that perspective is that um, one of the reasons why I did want to move to Canada is that the farmers, but the populace as well, is um, more open to learning and hearing about different things. In the U.S., uh, we're, we're very um, reticent about what we know, and this is what we know, and this is all that we know, and we're not going to learn anything different. There's not as much a desire for learning and, and putting innovations in place. Um, and wanting to do that. And, and so, uh, you know, you find these, these pockets in the US, but I think overall in Canada, it seems like, and that goes, as I said, from, from farmers to consumers, there's more of a desire to try new things. Um, and uh, the other, one of the other main reasons, uh, I had been working, as you said, been working for a while uh, in Canada. Um, and over the years, throughout my a 25 year career, it, it hasn't been, there There have been times when I've done work up in Canada um, over that time, but uh, that has increased over the last few years. And one of the things that has really driven me to wanna come to Canada, especially to Alberta and the Prairie provinces is that I do see that there is um, some pretty great potential in the Prairie provinces to get uh, true no-till, true organic, uh, to actually work and and to be able to function in that way. Um, in, in many cases, I think there are some places in which we can get that to work in, in some way where you may have um, reduced tillage or a rotational tillage or, you know, an occasional tillage every uh, few years or something like that that we could get to work. But I think there are some opportunities given the, the climate um, having the winters that, that exist in the prairie provinces, uh, having the, the climate as far as um, a little bit of a drier environment than some of the, I did work in Pennsylvania at the Rodell Institute, as you noted, and being in uh, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, where you don't have as harsh of winters and you also don't uh, have um, the level of 
uh, precipitation that they do in that environment. I also worked in the Dakotas, which is a very dry environment, and most recently came from Arizona, which is a desert. So, you know, understanding the, the impact of moisture on uh, how we could get this system to work. And the other thing that I think would allow this system to work in this environment is that ecologically, uh, these are prairies. And in trying to, when I was in Pennsylvania, ecologically, that was a forested ecosystem. And so trying to get true organic, true no-till to work in a forested ecosystem, what was natively a forested ecosystem, the parent material, uh, the primary vegetation, the um, seed bank, all of those things were forested based here uh, in, in many, in much of the prairie provinces, again, we do have forested areas, uh, but in much of the prairie provinces, it is prairie based um, ecosystems, which I think is part of the key to being able to get true organic, true no-till to work. Um, so it's an interesting puzzle that I continue to work with various producers on, on trying to figure out how we can, how we can address that challenge, but it's fun. I like it. And now I feel like I know what the topic of, if we can get you back for another <laughs> webinar, I want to explore what true no-till and true organic really does look like. So uh, maybe I'm trying to invite myself back to this, because I completely enjoyed the last hour and a half of getting to, to talk and to listen. And thank you all for the, the questions you brought in. I think they were excellent and unpacked even more learning, I know, for myself. Um, so again, Chris, thank you so much for your time. and. Uh, Glad to have you here in Alberta and uh, part of uh, helping us solve these puzzles. Thank you so, so much. Marie, I'll pass back to you. Yeah, thank you again, Chris, so much uh, for sharing all this information with us. And we're so lucky to have you here in Alberta. We're really happy about that um, over the next couple of years here, what you'll, what you'll bring to our province and to the prairies. And also thank you, Brenda, for joining us today and asking some really great questions and getting the conversation going. So. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Thank you again, Chris, and thank you, Brenda. I hope everyone has a great day. If you'd like to learn more about what we can do for your part of rural Alberta, please visit our website at rr2cs.ca.